And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kirby Lambert, who missed that first conference by a mere nine years. <laughs> Kirby arrived at the Montana Historical Society from Texas in 1985 to work as a registrar in the museum program. He became the curator of collections in 1989, the curator of art in 2002, and the outreach and interpretation program manager in 2007, a position he served in until his retirement just two years ago in 2021. Perhaps given his talk title, it is fitting that I introduce Kirby with some numbers. During his 36-year career at MTHS, Kirby curated over 30 exhibits, wrote over a dozen articles for Montana, the magazine of Western history, co-authored four books, and organized at least 12 history conferences. And he's working on a new history book involving numbers, The History of Montana in 101 Places. Please welcome Kirby Lambert, who will be sharing 50 things I know about Montana history. <clears throat> um, sure, I'll let Renan do the technology part because I'm quite sure I could mess it up. Uh, thank you, Molly, for that nice introduction. Um, you make me sound like I actually did something when I was at work, so <laughs> I appreciate that. And I also noticed that the governor was smart enough to record his message so he didn't have to get up this early. Um, so thank you all for being here. Well, as you might expect, the number 50 was chosen to celebrate the fact that this is the 50th time fans of Montana history have gathered for this conference dedicated to the study of our past. Before I began working on this talk, I thought it was going to be a simple project. But it's, I soon realized that it was going to be a lot more difficult than I thought. Not because I didn't have enough to say, but because I had way too much. Um, ultimately, more ideas remain on the proverbial cutting room floor than made it into the presentation. But even so, the only way I could keep the number down to 50 was through what we'll call creative numbering. Please note that if a slide has a number like the one ones you see here, it counts as one of my official musings. If it doesn't have a number, it doesn't count. Um, so think of these more as a footnote or just an explanatory sidebar. I hate to use the word random to describe my approach, but with 50 ideas to get through, we're only going to be hitting the high points. As you listen, you'll likely realize that at least some of what I have to say falls more under the heading of opinion than fact. And it's even possible that some of you might disagree with me. If that happens, and you do take umbrage to something I say, Molly wants you to take it up directly with her rather than me. You know, she never actually said this to me in so many words, but I'm pretty sure that's how she feels about it. <laughs> After all, as director of the Historical Society during this time of expansion, it's not like she has anything else to worry about. Finally, I know that there are those of you out there who think that I probably don't know a sum total of 50 things altogether, much less about any one subject. And yes, I'm looking at my wife when I say that. <laughs> so let's get started. My first point, titles can make a difference. I could have called my talk some things I think or things that might or might not be true, but that just doesn't convey the same sense of authority that 50 things I know does. Likewise, Charlie could have called this painting Buffalo Crossing a River, but it would not have nearly the impact that Russ's chosen title gives it. His title imbues the painting with so much more meaning and helps us understand Russell's feelings about his adopted home state. In the same way, these iconic book titles inform our identity as Montanans. Even if we haven't read these books, their titles still speak to us. At the same time, we know there are many excellent books that have titles that might be memorable for other reasons. For example, some authors might prefer to make their point through understatement. <laughs> Seriously, they only get mad sometimes when the Blackfeet kill them? This is a romance novel that features the Russell Collection at the Historical Society. It's called Dream of the West, and that's not a bad title. 
But what's really memorable about this book is its cover. It features a saguaro studded Mount Helena in the background. <laughs> and not to give anything away, but at one point the hero carries the heroin from the parking lot to the top of the mountain without even breathing heavily. <laughs> That's at least a mile and a half and a 1,000 foot elevation gain. Although I do have to warn you, the heavy breathing comes later in the book. <laughs> History, like life, is better if we don't always take ourselves too seriously. Or, as Charlie Russell said, life has never been too serious with me. I've lived to play, and I'm playing yet. Laugh and good judgment have saved me many a black eye. You might notice a Russell image or a reference or two to the cowboy artist in this talk. When I was in college, one of my professors told us that if we're ever asked a question about English literature and we don't know the answer, just guess Shakespeare and you're most likely to be right. For me, my Montana go-to is Russell, and it turns out that Shakespeare might not be a bad second guess. And sometimes you even get Russell and Shakespeare at the same time. In 1902, Nancy Russell attended a picnic held by the ladies of the Great Falls Shakespeare Club. It was supposed to feature a performance of Midsummer Night's Dream, but unfortunately, it got rained out before the play could start. This sketch is Russell's response to, to the drenching, and the sculpture is Pollock, one of the characters in the play. Of course, not all of Montana history is funny or entertaining. Far from it, in fact. Many stories from our past are tragic. Along with the good, we need to acknowledge and try to understand the bad. If we're going to let history fulfill the potential it offers for helping us improve our future. The story of our past is complex and doesn't always lend itself well to the sound by society in which we live. And that's an ironic thing for me to say, given the nature of this presentation. Often, whether it was something good or bad depended upon your perspective. The study of history is far more beneficial to us when we spend more time trying to understand the circumstances, perspectives, and motives of those involved, rather than simply judge them by today's standards. Montana history is both an epic saga and a short story. Humans have lived in this place we now call Montana for at least 13,000 years. Non-Indians arrived on the scene just about two and a half centuries ago. Most often, when we discuss Montana history, what we're really talking about is this post-contact period. Before that, we classify it as prehistory and let archaeologists tell that part of the story. Even so, the fact that American Indians were here first, with well-established cultures, languages, and ways of life has to be the understanding for all the rest of Montana's story that follows. Montana wasn't empty and the land was not unused. It was just not being used in a way that Europeans could recognize. As non-Indians increasingly encroached upon their traditional homelands, indigenous peoples, understandably, fought back, winning some of the battles but ultimately losing the war. By the closing decades of the 19th century, even sympathetic Euro-Americans saw American Indians as a vanishing race, cultures that were destined to disappear. But in spite of efforts to the contrary, ranging from military attacks to forced assimilation at boarding schools, Montana's native peoples remain resilient. As evidenced by the tribal flag plaza that was recently added to the front of the state capitol, indigenous peoples are very much still here, and their story is our story. In fact, Montana history is not just one story, but many stories woven together, much like a Métis assumption sash, to form a colorful whole made rich by the combining of so many different threads. Or, if we're talking about political history, a crazy quilt might be a better analogy. Montana was at one time much more ethnically diverse than it is now, and much of our history is a story of immigration. In 1900, 25% of Montana's residents were foreign born. According to the 2020 census, that number has dropped to 2.2%. Today, approximately 50% of Montana's current residents were born in the US, but outside of the treasure state. 
which means that the other half of us had to be smart enough to get here as soon as we could. <laughs> Even in prehistoric times, people were moving here from other places. While some tribes maintained their presence in Montana since time immemorial, other tribes have origin stories that place them elsewhere in North America before moving to Montana sometime later. While greed and a lust for power played a large role in the state's development, and the lure of furs, gold, and other riches drew the first large influx of non-Indians into the territory, by far the greatest number of people coming in here were and are driven by a desire to cre create a better life for themselves and their families, whatever form that better life might have taken. Driven by war, poverty, a lack of opportunity, or a search for freedom, immigrants made the hard decision to leave behind everything that was familiar to make a new life in a foreign land. In an age when we're a plane ride away from anywhere in the world, I can't imagine how hard it would have been to leave your family knowing that you'd likely never see them again. To encourage people to make that difficult decision, there was a variety of entities engaged in selling Montana. This included steamboat companies and railroads who sought to build up their clientele, and the US government, which gave away 32 million acres of land in an effort to help build the nation. Joining these promoters, towns from Alzada to Zortman were eager to boost their own cause as being the most desirable of Montana destinations. And in some cases, we're not even sure who was doing the boosting. We don't know who's behind the slogan, we sure like Montana, but you can't go wrong with a picture of a cute kid. <laughs> or can you? <laughs> I'm not convinced that a disembodied head floating over a muddy street is the best way to get me to move to Ingemar. <laughs> but if you're worried about what kind of future this poor child might have had, you can relax. Even without a body, she grew up to become a successful actress on the Butte stage and eventually met a like-minded fellow. <laughs> and clearly, I was wrong. This postcard is captioned, a busy day in Ingemar, so their strategy must have worked, at least for a little while. <laughs> Railroads and others promoted Montana as a land flowing with milk and honey, or maybe even a pot of gold. But what did people find once they got here? Did the promise, did the reality live up to the promise? Sometimes. Some miners did strike it rich, even though most didn't, and the old growth forest west of the divide were ripe for harvest. During the early years of the homestead boom, above average rainfall in the eastern part of the state produced good crops, which led to the growth of bustling communities and a sense of hope and prosperity. Beginning in 1917, however, drought hit the state hard, more than a decade before the Great Depression's Dust Bowl. By 1925, half of the state's homesteaders had lost their farms. As people left, schools and stores closed and small communities shrank or folded. Montana was the only state in the Union to lose population between 1920 and 1950. This man is just one of the many thousands who joined the exodus to greener pastures. You can see that 20 miles from water, 40 miles from wood, we're leaving dry Montana and we're leaving her for good. Montana weather has always been a major factor defining life under the big sky. This of course is especially true for people who have to be outside. In times past, it could even be challenging for those who were indoors. In a letter to his wife, one Virginia City miner apologized for not writing sooner, but then explained that his ink had been frozen. <laughs> because he could easily afford to do so, mining magnate Tommy Cruz relied on this deluxe electric bathrobe to help him keep warm inside. <laughs> Granville Stewart drew this sketch of Missoula noting that there was 12 inches of snow and the temperature was 34 below. Accordingly, I think we can give him a pass for the fact that this sketch is not well finished. <laughs> and in 1939, the 
Chinook Opinion reported that sleeping with his potatoes to keep them from freezing is only a small share of the herder's trials. While out working, his potatoes and canned goods must be wrapped in his bedding. At night, he returns to a cold wagon and frozen water buckets. But weather wasn't the only hardship. Before, increasing mechanization during the 20th century so dramatically changed the way we do things, life for many was defined by backbreaking labor. Not just for the men, but for women as well. And even if modern forms of social media had been available to them, these were not people who had the time or energy to take selfies or doom scroll on their iPhones. <laughs> or were they? I think Evelyn Cameron totally would have had an Instagram account, <laughs> foregoing her copious diaries to be an online influencer instead. And speaking of women, Montana history is full of amazing women. If you don't know the stories, these stories, you're missing out, and it's time for you to remedy that. And humans were not the only ones who contributed relentless toil to the state's development. Even though they weren't necessarily the hardest workers, dogs are still the best animals from Montana's past. If it happened in Montana history, dogs were there. They may not have been front and center, but they're in the picture somewhere. Sometimes they were work animals, but most often they provided the essential service of companionship. And just because they're cool and not nearly as ubiquitous as dogs, bears rank a close second. Unless you're talking football, <laughs> and then the grizz still come in second. Actually, I just said that to get Rich Sharstad's goat, and I don't even know if he's here. Um, <laughs> he's such a cat fan. But in reality, I don't have a dog in this fight. <laughs> but if I did, it would have to be a bulldog. <laughs> because nine of Montana's high schools have adopted the bulldog, bulldog as their team mascot. <laughs> and even though I claim that dogs and bears are the best, that is, they're my personal favorites, they weren't actually the most important animals in Montana's past. That distinction would have to go to buffalo. For millennia, these majestic beasts were the source of most of the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, tools and equipment for Montana's first peoples. By the early 1880s, the millions of bison that had roamed the Great Plains were virtually extinct. Their demise was the result of market hunters spurred by economic gain, as well as intentional effort to further subjugate native peoples by removing the animals upon which they had depended for so long. Initially, hunters focused only on the hides, but later, a demand developed for the millions of skeletons left drying on the prairie as bones and skulls were shipped east, where they were used in manufacturing such things as fertilizer, gunpowder, sugar, and bone china. With the demise of buffalo, cattle replaced their wild cousins as the most bountiful mammals on the Montana Plains and one of the state's primary economic drivers. Such was their prevalence that in 1966, Margaret Scherf, a legislator from Flathead County, published an article in Harper's Magazine titled, One Cow, One Vote in which she facetiously made the case that because of the number of big ranchers representing sparsely populated legislative districts, cows actually had more political clout in Montana than people did. <laughs> the acquisition of horses in the 18th century transformed life for plains people, enabling them to travel farther and faster and carry more possessions. Horses, combined with the newly acquired guns, also revolutionized the way they conducted battle and hunted buffalo. And well into the 20th century, horses remained as one of Montana's primary sources of power. In transportation, agriculture, mining, lumbering, and even warfare, horses were essential as beasts of burden and for many served as prized companions. 
Horses also provided backup in the early days of automobile travel when roads were anything but reliable or even non-existent. Even as we can laugh at the irony of a horse and cowboy having to rescue this or that early day off-roader, we tend to forget that our ancestors laughed too, sometimes a lot. We may not always appreciate their sense of humor or get the joke if we don't understand the context. And this is a case where I don't know the context. It's an invitation to a party at the Montana Club. I'm quite sure it's supposed to be humorous, but I don't, other than the Roman emperor, I don't know who Nero was or pop, what pop means. But um, I think if we knew the story behind this, we would find it funny. <laughs> But some things don't change, and the humor is still very evident. This is a happy family, very strongly attached to one another. <laughs> Likewise, leisure activities were just as important to our ancestors as they are to us, even though with the 60-hour work week, earlier generations had far less time to develop, to devote to leisure pursuits. Most often, people had to make their own fun. Almost every group imaginable formed bands, ranging from the Polson Ukulele Ladies Band to the Improved Order of Red Men in Phillipsburg and the Mile City Cowboy Band. And sports were always popular. Horse racing and Indian relay were favorites, as was baseball, of course. And it was surprising to me how popular boxing was. Maybe because you didn't need anything besides gloves and a rope and some spectators to serve as the ring posts. <laughs> and sometimes all you wanted to do was relax and enjoy a quiet lunch with your favorite pig. <laughs> For many, the consumption of alcohol was a welcome component of a good time. When Evelyn Cameron arrived to photograph this wedding, as was their tradition, these Germans from Russia had already been drinking for a couple of days. <laughs> and if you found yourself in Glendive with a big thirst, you might think that you'd hit the jackpot. Unfortunately, the message on the back of this card reads, Dave, this is out where the country is wild and the beer flows from big bottles. You should see this place so that you can be disappointed too. <laughs> Not everyone approved of liquor, so this particular form of fun was halted at midnight on December 30, 1918, with the enactment of a statewide ban on alcohol a full year before national prohibition began with the passage of the 18th Amendment. It seems particularly cruel to me that they didn't at least wait until January 1st so that people could have enjoyed one more tipsy New Year's Eve. <laughs> Unlike homesteaders and miners and others who came to Montana to work, early tourists came for the sole purpose of enjoying themselves, and they had many natural wonders to choose from. No one can argue that the crown of the continent, Glacier National Park, belongs to Montana, but we also claim Yellowstone, even though most of the park is situated in Wyoming. I think there are three reasons for this. First, three of the parks five entrances are still in Montana. Second, for the first 60 or 70 years of its existence, most visitors came by train, and most of those coming by train traveled, the, took the Northern Pacific across Montana to Livingston, or eventually Gardner. For them, a trip to Yellowstone was, in fact, a trip to Montana. The only part of Wyoming they saw was the park itself. And finally, the Historical Society's incredible Haynes photo collection gives us a legitimate claim on Yellowstone's history, since for many years, Haynes was the official park photographer. In addition to national parks, Montana has many wonderful state parks, the first of which was Lewis and Clark Caverns, which was originally known as Morrison Caves. The caves themselves are part of the Madison Limestone Foundation formation, which formed more than 300 million years ago. But many of the park's facilities that we ha still have, that we still benefit from today, were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the 1930s as part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. By far, the largest New Deal project in Montana was Fort Peck Dam, which at 250 feet high 
and four miles long, is the largest hydraulically filled dam in the United States. Most importantly, though, its construction brought desperately needed work to tens of thousands of unemployed Americans hard hit by the Great Depression. In contrast to the vast scale of Fort Peck, the sm state's smallest Depression era enterprise might have been the Success Cafe in Butte. Please note, if you don't eat here, I will vote for Hoover. <laughs> and that was a serious threat indeed for a heavily unionized labor mecca. <laughs> History, of course, is all about time, and that's what I'm running out of. From Christine's perspective, one of the worst things a speaker can do is run over time and throw the conference schedule out of whack. <laughs> Believe me, as a former conference organizer I know, and some of you, in fact, may still be on my list. <laughs> Maybe the best thing for me to do at this point to wrap things up is to consider briefly what history is not. First and foremost, history is not boring. And it's not current events. The study of history requires the passage of time before we can fully understand what was happening. History is not always about what we know. Sometimes it's about what we don't know. Like what caused Thomas Francis Marr's death in Fort Benton? Was it an accident or was it murder? Do we really know the meaning behind prehistoric pictographs like the ones found at Bear Gulch? And this, <clears throat> cryptic po this postcard with its cryptic ins inscription, this is how the accident happened, certainly raises more questions than it answers. <laughs> And notice there too, she's a cowboy girl, not a cowgirl. <laughs> and history is not only about the deeds of well-known movers and shakers. In fact, most of history is comprised of everyday lives of men and women whose deeds went unrecorded and whose names we will never know. We can say what history is not fairly succinctly, but can we sum up what history is with a pithy quote? Well, it's been said that history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> history is the same damn thing over and over. And history never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. <laughs> in the case of Fanny Benton Connor, who was a teacher in and homesteader near Rudyard, for the entire year of 1921, she kept a journal entirely in rhymed verse. And I find this amazing, just like the many amazing teachers we continue to have all across the state, some of whom are in this room today. So your homework after this talk is to find a teacher and thank them for what they do. If you want. <laughs> if you want extra credit, keep a journal for the next year entirely in rhyme verse and bring it to next year's history conference. <laughs> Another of, hist of history's rhythms is provided by the changing of seasons. First peoples gathered food and medicinal plants according to an annual cycle we often refer to as the seasonal round. For many of us, fall means harvest time, falling leaves, and golden days. And it also means it's time for the annual Montana History Conference. It's been that way for five decades now. The idea for the conference, as Molly told us, grew with an ad hoc group of academic librarians and archivists known as the Council to Preserve Montana History. They started meeting about 1970 with a goal of sharing ideas about collecting, preserving, and making available Montana history resources and halting the loss of any material that would help to sell, tell the story of Montana. When the idea was first proposed to the council, many members felt that they were not the proper entity to host such an event. No one was eager to take on the extra work. Until Sam Galu MHS director Sam Galuli volunteered his staff. Then he retired. <laughs> Archivist Jeff Cunniff did much of the work organizing the first conference as did archivist Brian Cockhill, who would later become director of the society. Librarian Harriet Malloy was the primary force that kept the council going. It faded away soon after she retired in 1977. 
Ironically, given the initial resistance on the part of some, the group's greatest contribution to Montana history proved to be starting the Montana History Conference. And now, here we are 50 conferences later. The first conference was held right here in what was then the Colonial Hilton Conference Center. You'll recognize the staircase. The cost of registration in 1974 was $6. Although that included three meals, people still complained that it was too expensive. <laughs> in spite of rumors to the contrary, I was not around for that first conference. In fact, I was a freshman in high school in East Texas. But I have attended every conference since 1985 when I moved here to begin working for the Historical Society. That means that this year makes my 39th consecutive conference. I wasn't able to attend all parts of every conference, but I was at least a part of each conference. I was there because it was part of my job, but it's always been an event that I truly look forward to each year. And I still do, even though I'm retired. And one of the things that I like best about the conference is the sense of connection it provides, not only to the past, but also to each other. And that sense of connection to a diverse and colorful past and to those who share a love of the past is one of the main reasons that being, Montana, being in Montana is, in fact, living life at its best. Thank you. Uh, well, thank y'all. I don't. I was going to ask Christine if we have time for questions or comments. Um, on the other hand, I think I just told you everything I know. So. Okay, Christine says we have a little bit of time. Is anybody? Anybody want to yell at Molly about something I said? <laughs> I think you missed that part. <laughs> All right, well thank you very much. <laughs>